Thank you for coming today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just to remind you to turn off your cell phone so we have no rude interruptions. Today we have uh, Elizabeth May and Dr. Gordon McBain. I believe they'll have something to say at the start, and then we'll take questions. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for coming today. Merci tout le monde d'être ici avec nous aujourd'hui pour une conférence de presse au sujet du changement climatique. Je suis très, très fière d'avoir avec moi aujourd'hui le grand spécialiste du climat, uh, Gordon McBain, un scientifique avec une réputation vraiment globale. Il était maintenant nommé à la tête du Conseil international pour la science. Et aujourd'hui aussi, uh, il y a un, un nouveau rapport qui a été relu, uh, the report that was released this morning through a press conference held via Internet, is the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change special report. Its title is Managing the Risks of Extreme Events and Disasters to Advance Climate Change Adaptation. The meeting is taking place as we speak in Uganda and is preparatory to, of course, the 17th Conference of the Parties, which I will be attending, which will take place in Durban. South Africa. I've asked Dr. McBain to join us this morning to particularly address his comments to the impacts in Canada that are, at this point, unstoppable due to the climate crisis, and of course, the importance of reducing greenhouse gases quickly enough to avoid even more extreme events. Uh, the, uh, the money in the 2011 budget, people very rarely, well, certainly the Harper government, doesn't identify what we are already spending in addressing climate crisis, over 300 million to prairie farmers, as an example, for flooded farmlands, over 150 million to deal with uh, the need for an all-weather road. They didn't previously need a road between Inuvik and Tuktoyaktuk because we didn't, we had winter roads that worked. And also another 70 million went in this year's budget to address storm surges in harbors. Again, very, very related to the impacts of climate change in Canada. So with those brief introductions, I turn it to Dr. McBain. Well, thank you very much, Elizabeth, and thank you for all being here and for those who are listening. Um, I've been involved in the climate change issue for many decades. Uh, one reason why I've been involved with the International Council for Science, uh, better known by its old name of ICSU, uh, was that it does and still is the co-sponsor or sponsor of most of the major environmental science programs around the world. The World Climate Research Program, which I chaired for on behalf of ICSU and other UN agencies in the sort of 88 to 94 era, is the scientific basis for reports like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, other projects also contribute. What this report today that was released, formally approved by the governments convened in Uganda, was a report looking at climate extremes. These are the flood storms and droughts, and around the world, flood storms and droughts caused approximately 75 percent of the disasters by the UN counting system. Uh, they call count for slightly more than 75 percent of the economic losses, which run in the hundreds of literally billions, hundreds of billions of dollars per year. Uh, they account for about half of the deaths, the fatalities, because when earthquakes untragically happen, they probably kill more people than a, than a flood or a storm. But we have had in, in this decade alone uh, cyclones in Myanmar and other such places that have killed over 150,000 people in one storm. And these people drown just in the waves and the water. And so the sea level, as it's rising, uh, due to climate change is making these people even more vulnerable and with the increased likelihood of intense tropical cyclones, hurricanes as we tend to call them, these kind of losses are going to mount. In Canada, we're already seeing the impacts. We can't say every one of these extreme events is due to climate change, but it does demonstrate our vulnerabilities and as the climate science is clearly showing that human-caused greenhouse gases is increasing, the risk, the probability, they say very likely, like over 90 percent confidence that there will be more very hot days, almost as much confidence for more heavy precipitation events. And for those of you who have been to Toronto or lived there, Finch Avenue Road wiped out in August 2005 by one rain event. It cost the city 60, 70 million dollars, I gather, to rebuild it, but the Canadian insurance companies paid 500 million dollars 
in insured payments to homeowners whose basements were flooded, who had the storm sewers, instead of taking the sewage out of the toilet, were now having the water run backwards up in and flooding into their basements. Not a pleasant sight. The roofs were torn off some of these houses and the rainwater comes in. So $500 million, which you think, well, the insurance companies paid it to what? Well, the insurance companies get the money from us. <laughs> they just raise the premiums collectively. So we're all paying for it. The Slave Lake fire that we had just this year uh, could well have been set by an arson. We don't know it's for sure yet. But it would not have spread as it did without the fact that we had dry, hot conditions and a forest ecosystem that is more vulnerable than it used to be because of climatic effects. And that cost the insurance companies about $700 million. The only event that exceeded that in Canadian insured lost history is the Eastern Canada ice storm of 1998. And what we're seeing is, although again, that one probably didn't have anything to do with climate effect, climate change, the probability of these kind of storms is changing as the climate changes. And the probability of ice events in places where we haven't had them is also increasing, much as that might seem a bit contrary to a warming kind of climate. Uh, and what I find really tragic is uh, a seminar I went to a couple of years ago with the mental health hospital people at McGill University who at that point, 2008, were documenting children who were 10 years old, who were in their mother's wombs during that ice storm event. They are showing statistically significant deficiencies in development that are irreversible due to the, and these, these doctors say, and I'm not a medical doctor, the doctors, the medical doctors say this is due to the stress on their mothers while they were carrying those childs. And we see these in other storm events. So we see a vulnerability in ways that most of us never think about, the vulnerability of these kind of events on the health of our children, both directly and indirectly, the effects on our economy. As Elizabeth has noted, we, we spend a lot of money on, let's say, adjusting for the fact that we have, we're not even fully adapted to our present climate, and the reality is that climate is changing. We need to be thinking. We need investments in science, and that's what this intergovernmental report also said, we need to invest in areas of observing system, but more often the understanding not only of the physical sciences, but the social economic health sciences related to disasters, extreme events. And the climate ones are the big ones, 75% of them around the world, and it, actually a bigger fraction in Canada, because we don't get, fortunately, many earthquakes. So I'll stop there and invite any comments or questions, uh, both from that point of view or the international role we can play, both Canadians and myself as one of them, in the International Council for Science and similar international activities. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? If not, I'll get the ball rolling, maybe warm things up. Uh, Elizabeth. No pun intended. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> uh, you mentioned uh, that this country's federal government is setting aside money mm -hmm. for things in areas of, from storm sewers to all season roads. But I'm wondering, is it, is it a tacit acknowledgement on their part that it's a problem? I mean, are they, are they not coming out fully and, and explaining along the lines that you folks both just have about the enormity of the problem? No, I think, I think our federal government is in denial. The funds that I mentioned that are in the 2011 budget are not identified anywhere as climate change related or as climate adaptation. The, uh, as a matter of fact, I mean, the killing the funding to the Canadian Foundation for Climate and Atmospheric Sciences, with which Dr. McBain was very involved, the killing funding for the Climate Change Scenarios Network, they've laid off all the, the term scientists who are working on climate change adaptation research group. And some of the people working there were actually doing, you know, basic engineering work to figure out in, in change precipitation regimes, we not only get flash floods such as the one that took out the Finch Road, uh, Finch Avenue, um, that was just an amazing collapse of the highway, $500 million damage, but you also have, with extreme precipitation events, more snow loads. So you have to figure out how do you, how do you engineer your roofing so that you don't have buildings collapse with people in them. From, uh, from snow loads on roofs. Now that kind of work was being done by people who no longer work in Environment Canada because they're gone. So this government does not acknowledge what the National Roundtable has warned them, that, we're, that we will be spending 
uh, uh, billions of dollars on climate change costs, in, and we're already spending what the National Roundtable didn't didn't state was what we're already spending now from climate change costs. They're huge. And so the analysis from the government is always, well, doing anything about climate change is going to cost our economy, so we're going to do as little as possible. Uh, and that, to me, is, is grossly irresponsible. Just one more question, and then we'll move to the floor. It's, uh, does it take sometimes a catastrophe along the lines of a Katrina here in this country to perhaps uh, put political pressure on a government to do what you want them to do? Well, I, I really don't. I, I think first to preface to say it's not what I want them to do, it's what 80 percent of Canadians want them to do and what the world scientific community is advising we must do. So at the international level, the position we're taking going to Durban, for instance, is grossly unhelpful to such an extent that the high, you probably saw in the Globe and Mail the interview with the High Commissioner from South Africa who was saying, look, this government is not helping. If we're going to get success in Durban, we need Canada to change its position. Does it take a disaster? I don't know. I never dreamed when I started working on this issue in 1986 that the recurring disasters that we now see, the loss of glacial ice, the loss of Arctic ice, the extreme weather events, m multitudes of really extreme events have occurred and continue to occur, and it does not seem to have any impact on our government. So I, I don't know how much worse it has to get before they wake up. Sonia Bell, iPolitics. Congressman Dana, so I wish you could expand on what's uh, new in this report that's being released today and what it means for Durban, how you want it to be addressed there. Well, the main things that's new is not the, let's say, the natural climate science part. It largely develops a little bit, changes slightly, but largely what was in the 2007 IPCC report. But I was one of the people pushing for this report to happen, first of all, and and we brought together, I was one of the convening lead authors for it, we brought together the disaster risk reduction community with the natural sciences climate change adaptation community. And that's one of the unfortunate silos of governments, including ours, that we have, you know, Public Safety Canada focused 99% on terrorism has, you know, embedded in the bottom of it something called Emergency Preparedness Canada on disasters and the climate change adaptation, what's left of it in, you know, in other departments. We need to bring these two silos of communities, of government approaches together. And so what we tried to do in this report, in the chapters on local, national, international governance mechanisms, how do we adapt to bring out the examples of what is being done in a positive way in, in some countries and without being too, well, we're not allowed to be too negative about things in these kind of reports for a particular country, but point out that how these things have made a difference. We have seen, <coughs> excuse me, very positive examples in Bangladesh, the reduction of the death rate in due to tropical cyclones from, by major factors due to the increased number, the, the storm warning systems, the evacuation processes, public education programs, investment in a very open, positive way in basically disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation in Bangladesh. They're proud of it. They talk about it. I was with them, one of their cabinet or members of parliament at a meeting in, in, Bel in Beijing two weeks ago, and marvelous guy. I'd never met him before, but he was talking. So this report is trying to show there are things we can do. Many of these things are first of all, recognizing the importance of needing to do them, but doing them in a conscious, open way and building on those to move things ahead. So it's, it's not earth-shattering but for us, but we hope by writing it, it will be, uh, let's say, pushing in the right direction for the policymakers who will hopefully read it. Um, and in Durban, are, that, are those policymakers you're trying to get it out to, if, what's the connection? Well, the timing vis-a-vis -vis Durban is not accidental, uh, but it's, you know, I mean, the, the idea is to emphasize to policymakers going to Durban, which, uh, I mean, they, they, they tend to largely talk about emission reductions of these things, and I think that's appropriate because, and, but we want to have the two messages. One is that the, there is things you need to do and can do and should do on climate change adaptation, but secondly, if we don't do anything about the rapidly increasing emissions, then what we're going to be facing in the decades to come will be even more horrendous, more 
overwhelming. Now that doesn't, that's not a big part of this report, but it's a message I'd like, to, I attach to this report. These are the, the kind of disasters we're seeing now. The projections are very likely we'll have more heavy precipitation events decade by decade in the future, and no matter what number you use to multiply by, by the time you go three decades out, and if you keep going five, six, seven decades out of continual warming, we're in real trouble. Mike D'Souza, Post Media News. Thanks, Levi. Just a science question first. Um, from the presentation you were giving me this morning and with the other Canadian scientists, uh, there was an element that, that spoke about extreme cold events also mm -hmm. being um, more likely. Can you explain, I guess, in a, how logically this is possible with that kind of warming? Or yeah. Um, well, I think actually it was a, a mistake in the sentence. Uh, the, the expectation is, and we, he and I discussed this before, is that we will have many fewer extreme, the, the number of extreme cold events will go, re, be reduced. We're going to have fewer of them. So I know when he so said... Fewer, yeah, more extreme no, cold. He, okay. he was talking about trends and things, and I, when I heard him say that, I said, I, like you did, I thought, that doesn't sound right. And no, okay. no, it's, they're going down. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, and uh, now just a general question. The environment minister last week did announce uh, 150 million, approximately, over yeah. five years for adaptation. Have you had a chance to look at that, and does it answer, or can it help Canada prepare for, for some of the, the more increasingly likely extreme events that we're going to be seeing? Well, um, it is, you know, it, funding if it actually follows through and is implemented in a way, then yes, it will help. Of course, we've seen as. Uh, Elizabeth has mentioned, the Canadian Foundation for Climate and Atmospheric Sciences, which I chair the board, we've been giving out approximately 14 to $15 million per year of funding to the climate science, the academic community, and that is now zero uh, because we were not refunded. There has been an allocation of funds to NSERC, but it's half as much uh, per year, and it's for five years. Our com commitment was for 10 years. And you need that sustained commitment because you build up networks of scientists. The idea you throw money in a bundle or have a photo opportunity and don't sustain it is not very productive scientifically. We have networks that we, can, we funded for five years that got a long way and built the capacity, built the team approach, the, the tools, the, the, well, quite frankly, simply the, the mechanical functions of models and computers and things. I've got the facilities, and now suddenly there's no money to do anything with all of this capacity, both people capacity, infrastructure capacity. So we've got facilities that are, well, in some cases, just now sitting idle. And that doesn't make much sense to me. So I don't know from the press announcements. I'm happy they're making an announcement about increased money for climate change adaptation. I'm waiting to see actually how it will be delivered and in which ways to communities. And I have just one point on that, if I may, is that the, the money for that was, that was announced, some was international, some was Canada, but none of it was to the kinds of programs that Dr. McBain is talking about. So losing the Adaptation Research Group at Environment Canada is a serious blow, and it's not addressed by that funding. The international money that Canada has committed, it's not clear to me from the funding announcement how much of that was redirected CETA money, how much was in the form of loans. So there, there remains to be a, a lot of work to tease it out. But let's be clear, $150 million, I mean, any amount of money that, that ends with the word millions, is, is a significant amount of money. But $150 million over five years, given the scale and scope of the climate crisis, is not even a drop in a bucket. It's the promise of a drop. It's really insignificant. Unless there are other questions, I think that concludes our news conference. Thank you very much for this. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Merci. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Let me give you back that front page since I didn't, I didn't write on it.